I titled the presentations, uh, presentation Bureau Lanes and the Peculiar Potential of the Uncooperative Principle. But by Bureau Lane here, I should also substitute in uh, Stickland. Okay, because it's really trying to explore a linguistic hypothetical that was constructed just because I think the concept is amusing. All right, but I'm hoping it will illustrate a number of things that you might find useful. Okay. So, first of all, some disclaimers. Um, since I knew this would be posted online and there was a 0.001% chance my dean might get a hold of it, um, <laughs> there is no like satire mark that's usable in PowerPoint, so I figured I would better say, yes, I, I know this is a fictional context. Okay, number two, I figure I should go with what my strengths are, and one of those is not knowing how to use PowerPoint, and so this will also serve as a demo of things that you're probably not supposed to do with PowerPoint. <laughs> Pack this many, this much text onto a slide. Now, the last one has to do with what I call implausible undeniability. <laughs> is that, um, I could claim it's hard to prove this is not scholarly if you really push it. And that's my story and I'll stick to it. <laughs> I've mentioned Bakhtin and everything. Okay, normal human spoken language is, we think, shaped by a number of factors, both pragmatic with a small p and pragmatic with a large p. Uh, one is information flow. <laughs> Humans appear able to manage a certain amount of information density within a certain amount of time. <laughs> Languages tend to approximately stick to that. Okay, so there were some recent studies showing, for example, that if there's not as much information packed into each syllable, people tend to produce the syllables more rapidly. And so within each time period, you're, it's, it's a bit like a conceptual throttle. You're, you're keeping the, the mixture at the right, right balance. Okay. Language can also be viewed as operating, uh, obeying a cooperative principle. I'm taking the term from Bryce. Uh, the link here you see is just the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which I think has a very good introduction of pragmatics in it, which is free. Okay. Um, it can also be viewed other ways, of course. The cooperative principle has been discussed a lot in linguistic pragmatics. It's not the only it's not the only way of doing things, but it's, it's a convenient one in using it. Also, speakers in natural language, spoken language are very tolerant of ambiguity as long as there's context available to resolve it. Of course, sometimes speakers don't judge the context the same way. Okay, so for example, five-year-olds always think adults are telepathic in those kinds of things. They can just use pronouns. And adults will know what they mean. All right, normal human written language. The restrictions on the information flow rate are not quite as narrow because the assumption is you can go back and reread things. All right, uh, mathematicians who are writing seem to assume you will go back and reread it at least 40 times. <laughs> okay. If you will, assume she will go back and reread it at least 140 times. <laughs> uh, but the cooperative principle can be viewed as working just as well as in spoken language. The idea is even writers who may be having some difficulties are trying to cooperate with the reader. This does not always apply to literary fiction. I mean, there's a set of constructs about difficult writing and writerly prose that involve, in a sense, violating some of those conventions of cooperation but it tends to stay within certain, certain boundaries. Still, though, they, they do get violated. I mean, uh, Jacobson once, uh, he didn't do it in English, but he referred to poetry as organized violence done to language. <laughs> okay. uh, what I'm going to be doing is more like disorganized play done with language and therefore may come as anti-poetry. <laughs> Lack of context makes ambiguity more significant. 
Here is the cooperative principle from Bryce 1975, fairly straightforward. Make your contribution such that it, as it is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. Sounds pretty straightforward. Bryce was primarily engaged in pulling out nuances of that. Since we're trying to cooperate, what else do we do? All right, here's another thing not to do with PowerPoint. Try to cram everything in one slide, but here you go anyway. Um, it's frequently discussed in terms of four maxims. Uh, maximum quantity, use the right amount of information. Maximum quality, say things that are okay, all right? Don't say things you know are false. Don't say things you lack evidence for. Say relevant things, maximum relation. Maximum matter, avoid obscurity, avoid ambiguity, be brief, be orderly. I know for some of you this is stuff you've seen 800 times, but I didn't know how to gauge that, so I figured I would, I would go ahead and include all of them. Well, what about uncooperativeness? People do regularly violate those maxims, all right? In everyday speech, people violate them in order to achieve cooperation at a higher level, in a sense. So a lot of politeness strategies, including ones that are incorporated in conlangs, are, in effect, pretending in a way. They're saying things in ways that the speaker would recognize as not being literally true as a way to be polite. Okay, so English speakers, I mean, one of our standard tricks is to pretend we're not getting orders. <laughs> right. You say, could you pass me the salt? The answer's not supposed to be just yes, and you sit there. It's like, I have that ability. All right. It's people know that when you say that, you're usually not actually using the form that matches, that matches the imperative, but you mean it as at least a suggestion. All right. Um, Bowsfield has uh, pointed out that the cooperative principle more properly describes linguistic cooperation than social cooperation. You don't have to assume that people are socially cooperating with each other in order to see what they're doing as still using an attempted shared code that's trying to get things done. Right? And for some reason, PowerPoint didn't let me do footnotes, so I had to do it by hand. Okay, the term uncooperative principle without a mouth, it's the non-deluxe version. Uh, it has been used a good many times, as you might expect. If we have a cooperative principle, we can talk about an uncooperative principle. Uh, one has to do with what I'm calling these local violations that have to do with signaling sarcasm or humor and all of those types of things. Right? At a more global level, we can talk about them describing situations in which parties do not construe each other as being cooperative. They may not want to cooperate with each other. Sometimes you don't want to be even linguistically cooperative if you're in a situation where you have to. Right? So what happens at least? I am rephrasing Rice's cooperative principle in a kind of cynical, uncooperative version. All right, which again, this is this is a pretty mechanical information. <laughs> but make your contribution as beneficial to yourself and as useless to others as you can conceivably get away with by whatever purpose of the talk exchange that you manage to trick or force the other party into accepting <laughs> while accruing as little risk to yourself as possible. <laughs> A lot of advertising language is in that category. It's not frozen and it's deep chill. <laughs> the law allows that. Okay, PR spin, the minute the politician tries to get out of something. Right. A lot of bureaucracies in self-defense mode. The inspiration for this cult was actually Sir Humphrey from the British uh, comedy Yes Minister. Uh, I will not read the whole thing, it's going to be posted, but the, um, it all hinges on the difference between the administration of policy and the policy of administration. <laughs> and how the policy of the administration of policy can interact with the administration of the policy of the administration, etc. 
<laughs> this is the scene where Sir Humphreys has been required to testify before a panel about an incident involving some bureaucrats, I believe, using public buildings to grow mushrooms and sell them. And he, is, after he is done with this, the people questioning him are basically in shock and can't do it. So it works. Right. So, why is this relevant to conlangs? Well, again, local violations of the cooperative principle give you phenomena like indirect fuel like the strategy. You're probably using those already, except maybe clean on. All right. <laughs> I think the point is not to have to like the strategies. Wholesale subversion of it can let you do some interestingly obnoxious things if you're conlang and have an excuse for it. All right, if you need one. Okay. So, for example, bizarre lexical proliferation that you can nevertheless say is limited to particular institutions. In this example, it's going to be a bureaucracy. Right? So, they don't need 400 words of snow because they live in a snowy environment. They have 400 words for snow because you annoyed them. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> Information flow characteristic that humans aren't able to handle yet well, yet don't buy you any additional specificity or fit more info into a smaller time period. Okay, so it can be as specific as if you will, but not in a way that's helpful. Or anything. <laughs> All right. Patterns contingent upon factors that even the matrix culture from which the language comes don't consider relevant at all. Right? Realism, if you're sketching certain kinds of complex cultures with particular kinds of social institutions. Now, for anthropologists, I should admit immediately, all cultures are complex. There's a particular type of complexity I'm referring to here, which has to do with basically putting up with things like large bureaucracies. So basically a nicely rational excuse with nicely in the etymological and modern sense to add rationally irrational patterns or items to your language. As an example, I'm going to use, uh, oh, I'm not the example yet, bureau uh, lanes, I'm simply speeding up to this, established bureaucracies Bureaucracies frequently have a vested interest in using language that's not understandable to the general public. I may benefit from a situation in which if you're trying to register your Oxford, you need to pay people, several people, my people, <laughs> okay? And you shouldn't be able to figure out how to do that off the top of your head because then why would you pay me? Right? <laughs> Uh, maximizing the amount of linguistic work that needs to be done. Fostering the perception that that really needs to be done because it is so complex that it, you, you don't want to work with that. I mean, it's, it, you need to leave it to experts. Okay. Um, once you get a critical mass of jargon terms that the bureaucracy is using, there's an inherent kind of inertia you can build up. Changing means that you've got all this soft linguistic cost you're going to have to, to get past, right? So if, so if we compare bureaucracy and rice as cooperative principle, instead of use as much info as needed, I don't have to give people information they actually need. <laughs> all right. Don't use too much information. This one's easy, all right? When you pay for it. Do you know which parts are important? No, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say things you know are false. This is where the word excellence usually comes in. <laughs> Don't say things you like evidence for. Saying things you like evidence for plus rank minus consequences equals leadership. <laughs> okay. Say relevant things. At some point it probably was relevant. I mean, a lot of times when the procedure starts out, there's reasons for all of that. It's over time it becomes less relevant. Avoid obscurity, that's job security. <laughs> uh, avoid ambiguity, 
Well, that's what the 40 years of training are for. Okay, be brief, no one is going to think it's important if it's brief. Okay, be orderly, well, having multiple disordered orders lets you be more orderly at multiple times. <laughs> yeah. The nice thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. <laughs> So, as an example, I developed a, a sketch shell, the, uh, the language should be a shore, in order to sort of play with some of these factors. It's envisioned as a governmental language developed across multiple regions over centuries, mostly by non-native speakers. This is in the sketch grammar I posted, but it's, um, it's an expansion sort of scenario, as with Alexander the Great or Kublai Khan. The figure in this case was Kalzak of the 20 goats. <laughs> but you develop large amounts of variation over the region over time, partly because it's just a big area with a lot of speakers, partly because it's mostly non native speakers using it. And they're cobbling things together. Um, turned into a pretense of a single monolithic language as part of self defense strategy by the bureaucracy. The way I set up the timeline is that a later reformer basically, one, takes the position that people used to use the language perfectly well until modern young people started misusing it because they're lazy. <laughs> okay. Number two, we need to save money by reforming the bureaucracy. <coughs> At which point the bureaucracy used his own words against him and said, well, since all the previous texts were correctly done, then these laws that you're proposing obviously need to be done in the correct texts, but the correct texts will disagree with each other. Right? So the way to maintain the pretense is basically to pretend that all of that variation was not variation. It was the appropriate forms to use in particular grammatical context. <laughs> okay. And of course, the authority to consider the text correct has to be kept within the bureaucracy or there with everything. So, Speech can be, uh, the yeshkur itself, what you actually learn when you start learning yeshkur is the form that the speech community officially considers wrong. Because the, any form could potentially be correct, you would need an expert to know. <laughs> All right, Sounds so, like it's cool. <laughs> they're not going to commit to saying it's wrong because it might be right under some situations, but probably not this one. <laughs> the one you're using is officially wrong. Everyone can agree on that. All right. The design is partly motivated by this desire to explore the hypothetical, a standard, non-standard version of the standard language no one actually uses. <laughs> Okay, most standard languages are ones no one actually uses. That part is not difficult. Okay. So, how do I set up the standard on standard? I've already given you the, the basic situation. You need uh, the standard to be so polymorphous. If you remember the original series, Star Trek episode of the game called Royal Fittage, where the whole point was that the rules be so complex no one would actually be able to learn them. This is kind of the mindset behind the official language, All right. which is which supposedly is published in a set of over 400 volumes of very thin paper. <laughs> Need a way to make the language polymorphous, collapse synchronic and diachronic variation into the system and claim that it's, it's all correctness. All right. So, a real example, often to import tariff renegotiation forms. Uh, the application form must use the word sovonic to refer to unprocessed almonds, kayar to processed ones. By the way, both of those contradict some of the rules of the grammar of the language that people actually learn, because the ones they learn are wrong. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, the former is measured in weight units of A7, lighter, lighter in weight units of A17. <laughs> okay, it goes on from this. Uh, it's basically it's a long list of extremely specific things you should need to know. Uh, it has to be on the right shade of paper. If that last bit sounds funny, you haven't worked in a university. <laughs> uses a completely different word that's in base law. <laughs> the actual reasons, the terms for all moments were borrowed from two different languages. The base weight in one case derived from the number of N8 containers, the first successful almond trading consortium, <laughs> could fit in a then standard northern new top of wagon. Right, so it, the idea is it comes from a document that was preserved. It's some actual people negotiated an actual trade deal with an actual wagon because of the historical contingencies of the period. You get all of these little details. It happened to be in the form of Yeshtur that these people were using in that spot at that time. But it gets reinterpreted as being, well, that's the right form for almonds for this. Um, the purported reason they come out with this incredibly bizarre underlying, underlying form that, of course, then gets mapped in the in phonological spell out, they don't call it that, but gets mapped into all of these other different forms given the other quote, grammatical features on both that are around it. Okay, <laughs> that form is pronounced Savannah in the neodasmotic ecclesiastical nomination. Okay, <laughs> neodasmotic, I have done the English equivalent of the Ashtor here. Neodasmotic has the Greek words for new and terra. <laughs> okay. The aprocessual is for the unprocessed almonds. <laughs> and the primitive law prefix. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, what is this letting me do? Um, the bureaucratic non-native speaker origin creates rationale for further ports that I have built into it. At this point, I might be able to get the other thing. Cases, 
but even when you're not stacking them, they have to kind of try to agree, which is the kind of thing you can do in a bureaucratic language, but the idea is people are sitting down with books and sketching this out. They're not having to speak it off the top of their heads. And it needs to be the kind of thing you need books for. Because <laughs> that way you can be the one that has them. <laughs> <laughs> Prepositional phrases do some rather odd things depending on what syntactic position you're using them in and whether the preposition is going with the pronoun or not. Uh, as the person who tried to put this together, not only do I have to use the chart to put them together, it pipes me. So I think it's working. <laughs> This next part, uh, prepositions also include a distinction that was made up in a, in a, a glossotechnia game, by the way, <laughs> which is between uh, concrete and abstract prepositions. Yeah. So that if you drop something into a well, for example, you would use the concrete preposition for in. But if you're sort of imagining yourself in a hypothetical situation or in a hypothetical well, you would use a different one. Okay. The idea is it's a little bit like the Norman versus Anglo Saxon differentiation for food terms, where the fancy one gets one set and the non fancy one gets another set. Historically, the concrete ones would be from the original language, the others are borrowed. The concrete ones are the only ones that get used on verb prefixes, for example. But the speakers won't admit that, of course. It all has to do with the grammar. Uh, another example. Minimize the big one. Actually, I'm staying on this one. I just need to, there we go. Evidentials. The evidential system is only vaguely logical. <laughs> the idea here is that when someone is setting up this, uh, a standard language, there's frequently a lot of apophenia involved. Uh, it is looking at a bunch of messy real language and saying, can I find a pattern here? There should be a pattern. Okay. In this case, an additional spin put on the system was that when they started doing the standard, the bureaucrats were trying to memorize it because it's not natural. They have to memorize it. There was a song about Chazek and the 20 goats, so they just used the goats as a mnemonic clause. Okay, thus producing a system in which each of the evidentials is associated with a goat. <laughs> and to make it a little easier, well, there are 20 of them, that's obviously the five elements and the four landforms. So it gets associated with those as well, the elements being solid, liquid, gaseous, subtle, and edible. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, and the little windows, so I'm scrolling the wrong way. She wouldn't come in walking at the same time, it's not one of my strongholds here. All right. When you get over to the, the last column, these are things that are sourced in the wider community, so I tried to gloss what they would mean. But the, the more active one, for example, when you use uh, as your evidential, those are the only adjectives in the language, by the way, are the evidentials. <laughs> because otherwise people would get good at saying them. <laughs> so you have to work up to it. So it is the equivalent of having according to Reddit world news. <laughs> it's like, here's some information. I'm not trusted as much as you want. <laughs> okay. So bizarre evidential system named after goats with philosophical connections. So, I had the noun. Yes, also noun classes. They use different base numbers. Oh. <laughs> and force you to have columns labeled number A and number B. 
<laughs> because number B is always a higher number than number A, but you can't count on it being singular and plural. Because people could figure that out easily, right? So if I use a counting term like John, uh, it is easy to end up thinking it means 10 if you've been looking at the wrong noun phrases because it actually does mean 10 in some of them. But if you use it in another noun phrase with a class 3, for example, it means 5. <laughs> the base number for class 3 nouns is 5. All right. Uh, one of these is used, here we go, number 4 is used for non aqueous dessert. <laughs> Base number 20 to the... <laughs> yes. But there are two base number 20s, it depends on which 20 it is. Because one of the 20s is two tens, and the other 20 is four fives. <laughs> now, before you laugh too much at that, I took the inspiration from an actual language, which is Sumerian. <laughs> because Sumerian did not apparently treat numbers as abstract entities. It was 20 of something, and it depended on the something of which it was. I think that part. <laughs> so, that? so class <coughs> maps are fish and trees and non-shiny minerals and green minerals in the green <laughs> This is oddly addictive once you start it. I have to admit. Right. It's, it's the next women smelling it's, the, it's, it's, it's more his category. Goats, of course, get their own. Goats all go in one category. Is that Goats 20 to the 12? No, no that's, that's footnote number 12. Okay, oh, just right. check. Six is kind of non aqueous desserts. Yeah. yeah. Distinctive smelling rock. <laughs> can you scroll up? Can you, can you, can you scroll up so I can read big, uh, class seven? Goats, valorous actions, umbrellas. <laughs> that was supposed to be a semicolon after injury and then I got a little bit of a little bit of a Wait, what would an informal eulation <laughs> Well, the, the informal eulations in this language are considered a grammatical class. And the idea is that you have to sort of announce when you're actually saying something that's supposed to have a legislative weight. Because it, it's signaling that you're starting into the part that's supposed to be, quote, correct, unquote. So you have to make the noise that means the following part will be official. <laughs> if you make it through to the end, you have to perform the part that says, okay, I don't think I made a mistake during that. <laughs> I'm just slightly curious, what is the noise that sounds, that it, what does this noise sound like that means the following part is official? I'm, a, I'm still sketching out how many of them there are. Okay. How many? <laughs> okay, because it also depends on what legislation it is. If it's about almonds, <laughs> what if there's an amendment? Like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Not aqueous dessert. Do you need to get back to your PowerPoint? This goes up on the website. This is what happens, by the way, when you have a standard grammar test to grade. <laughs> Did you assign grades based on their correct usage of that grammar? No, well... 
He provides feedback to each of his students, but only in yesh kur. <laughs> Right. Your score is 64. <laughs> Figure out the noun class. If you have taught anything that's a foreign language, you know this can have weird distortive effects on the language. People are trying to memorize things. And they end up with a system that's more easily memorizable instead of the real system. <laughs> uh, you can get more artificial paradigms just created by the desire to find patterns. This is the apophenia again. All right. We think there are some Sanskrit forms that were made up to fill in gaps in the paradigm, right? Uh, paradigms can then trigger expansion, cross-linking of analogies. If you look at what happens with astrology and numerology, a lot of that is interlocking association chains. You start associating things with numbers, and then the things that are associated with that number associate with other things that are associated with it. Okay. Growth of additional metaphorical connections based on institution and term references, like the use of a particular color of paper. Uh, if you work in an environment where the really obnoxious forms are always on goldenrod paper, because they call that shade of yellow goldenrod, you will hear people saying things like, are you having a goldenrod moment? <laughs> <laughs> If everyone in the community uses this kind of thing, it becomes part of the language, right? The fact that outsiders cannot understand it is a feature, not a bug. <laughs> if you're a semanticist, start using the word comprehend in ways that normal people don't understand. <laughs> So, the form used in grammatical sketch is positioned as the form under common deprecation. And another illustration, I'm using deprecate in the non-programmer sense. In other words, the original meaning to kind of trash talk something. Uh, modern software, it means this is obsolete, as far as I understand. Okay. Uh, all civil servants are required to learn it as a sterling example of what is definitely wrong. Right form requires team of experts. So in other words, it's becoming a lot like linguistics. <laughs> All right. Terminology that may look familiar but doesn't mean what you think it does. I made the joke about semantics a minute ago because it was, it was readily available. But that, that happens with any institutionalized language use that starts developing internal meanings for the terms. It separates from what the rest of the language community does. I work in an English department. People in critical theory talk about interrogating texts. They are not strapping them to tables and watering them. <laughs> um, I don't think they believe the text is answering them back either. But it's just interrogate has picked up that meaning. It becomes a marker of group membership. And it becomes the kind of thing that students then can signal membership in the community by learning how to use. Okay, so it, obviously it's easy to get humor value out of it and make fun of it, but it is the kind of thing that happens in the enterprise that we uh, Hume discussed it a bit in terms of scientific method when, when disciplines get their own field in terms of jargon and so forth. But if you think of bureaucracies, they're particularly suited to self-defense in a way, and this makes a great self-defense mechanism. Right? In the official Yashkur tradition, these factors are determined by literary regulatory context. I'm assuming I'm wrong time, so I'm going to speak up. Um, stepping back from this and talking about natural languages, 
Yeshur could be imagined as a set of forms associated with very long vectors of contextual elements specifying where they go. So if you're talking about almonds and its tariff regulation and put in a couple of hundred other ands, you get a particular form. Right? So you got, a, you got a long vector of factors, you get a particular form. Natural languages can be modeled in the same way. In fact, a lot of modern corpus modeling of text works that way. You think of these in terms of vectors, pretend it's in a dimensional space, etc. Okay. I know how to say the term dimensional space. Do not, mean, do not assume that means I know what it means. <laughs> Um, in natural languages, the relevant factors include time, community structure, social variable, genre, register, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm hedging on genre and register because everybody loves arguing about what those terms actually mean. I just want to point out that all of the various definitions still work for this. Um, prescriptive is how suggested saying that what's correct English, for example, depends on what's in the great works of English. That's mostly prescriptivists who have not carefully read the great works of English <laughs> and looked at the words. Okay. If you take that seriously, well, what does Beowulf mean? Does it apply to all submarine combat situations? <laughs> <laughs> Does it apply only to ones in which you are fighting the monster's mother? <laughs> or does that metaphorically extend to mother ships, like large submarines? Do you have to use all they want? <laughs> so, to end up here, using a form like that will get you in trouble in all modern linguistic theories, though, because you'll notice it ends with dot. <laughs> and there is the problem that ducks may be just small geese, taxonomic issue there. All right, so avoid that one. Also, of course, it is the stem for Bakhtin and not almonds, which you may have picked up. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> We have time for maybe two questions. Uh, not a question, but a shameless plug. Google amazing grice. <laughs> okay. Any other small questions? Okay. Wait. Go ahead. Is is Sumerian really like that? It's not that Byzantine, I guess. <laughs> but it's yeah. Because that would be anachronistic. <laughs> um, what it does do is have different basic measurements for different kinds of trade items. So grain is not measured in the same units as cattle, for example. And the count terms don't mean the same thing. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you.